Welcome everybody, and it's a special honor to have Raphael here. Raphael Dunning basically started his career in Cambridge at, at Natural Science, and he made his PhD at, in the Department of Material Science and Metallurgy. Raphael, I really admire his work as he went through his career through different steps of analyzing materials like metals, ending up looking at magnetic domains. And he traveled also through the world. And the nice thing about Raphael is he's always available. If you want to have or have questions, he's independent if you're a career, early uh, career scientist or an age person, he's usually open-minded and, and will help you. He's currently the director of the Ernst Ruska Center, one of the directors. And what I also think is of interest for us as microscopists really, he brought funding for electron microscopy to the level where beam lines, synchrotrons are our satellites. And I would like to hand over to Raphael. I won't spend too much time explaining what his career is because he has a lot of to tell and share with us. And I hope Raphael, you are ready to share your screen. Oh. Okay, so many thanks, Roger, for the introduction, uh, and uh, many thanks for inviting me to speak today. I was told I have about 40 or 45 minutes, and I was given the title Transmission Electron Microscopy as a Research Infrastructure in Europe. Uh, research infrastructures are in some way a dry topic, uh, but I'll try to take you through uh, what we're doing at the level of an institute as a country and also on a European level from a scientific perspective and also from the perspective of strategy and uh, funding and hopefully partnerships uh, beyond uh, Europe, hopefully to uh, different groups and laboratories in Australia. Uh, my background is in material science, and so most of the examples which I'll show will focus on material science, uh, but uh, we try to link to electron microscopy for biology wherever possible. They are a far more organized community already in Europe uh, in many ways. So today I will go through six topics. First of all, I'll introduce where I work, which is the Ernst Ruska Center in Ulich, named after Ernst Ruska, who was one of the co-discoverers of the transmission electron microscope. And then on a national level, I'll explain how we've managed to establish ourselves on the German national roadmap for large infrastructure. And then on a European level, I'll go through something which is referred to as the ESTEAM project, which is a network which provides uh, funding to establish a network between different European electron microscopy laboratories. I'll go on to something called eDream, which is a dis distributed research infrastructure for electron microscopy, which we are just establishing. Then I'll mention the analytical research infrastructures in Europe, and I'll briefly mention the European Microscopy Society. First of all, uh, just to give an introduction to where I work, uh, as I mentioned, it's called the Ernst Ruska Center. It's based in a town in Ulich, a town called Ulich in Germany, and uh, Ulich hosts uh, the Ulich Research Center, which is part of the Helmholtz Association in Germany. This is similar to the Max Planck Society, but it has a strong focus on operating large infrastructures. You, and uh, and electron, electron microscopy is classified as a large infrastructure uh, within the Helmholtz Association, and that provides us with continuity of funding and also uh, pr provides us with um, salaries for staff who have long-term contracts to operate electron microscopes. This is a map of Germany on this slide, and the Ulich Research Center is shown uh, with a red circle on the left. Uh, the Helmholtz Association as a whole employs about 45,000 people, 
6,000 are in Ulich, and somewhere between 50 and 100 work in the Ernst Riska Center focusing on electron microscopy. Looking from above, Ulich is located in a forest. Uh, it's a former nuclear research facility, and the Ernst Riska Center is marked by a red circle here. Uh, there are some advantages to being in the middle of nowhere, but one of the disadvantages becomes apparent if you look on Google Earth from above, because now on a uh, at lower magnification, uh, you can also see that the Ulich Research Center is located uh, just a few kilometers from two large surface coal mines in Europe. And that uh, also presents us with challenges for isolating the microscopes from uh, the vibration from the coal mines, which are operating 24 hours a day. So um, the Ernst Riska Center operates as a national user facility. Um, I should say that electron microscopy in Europe is still primarily a laboratory-based technique operating in universities, and Ulich is one of the small number of locations in Europe where electron microscopy operates as a national and international user facility. It's been operating in this way since 2004. Uh, access is provided on the basis of incoming scientific proposals. We have to guarantee 50% of the time on the electron microscopes to external users. We have a joint governance together with the closest university, which is Aachen University. And there's a strong focus on developing techniques and instrumentation. The picture on the right shows our current building. The two towers on either side of the terrace house two of our largest electron microscopes, which uh, are uh, each about four and a half meters tall. We currently operate somewhere between 15 and 20 tools in our building. Of those, there are six aberration corrected electron microscopes. The years of commissioning are shown on this slide. The most unique instrument is the one in the middle referred to as the Titan Pico instrument. Uh, and uh, this one it is chromatic and spherical aberration corrected. It is similar to the team microscope in Berkeley, uh, except the chromatic aberration corrector is three generations newer. Each of the microscopes is focusing on a different technique. Uh, they, uh, there is interoperability between all of them. You can, well, between, the, between five of them. So you can take experiments from one to the next one and each one is uh, focusing on one technique, meaning that it doesn't have to be realigned for anything else. We have two further aberration corrected instruments arriving this year. The funding comes centrally from the Helmholtz Association and from grants, and uh, we have to renegotiate our budget every year based on how we perform scientifically the previous year. So nothing is guaranteed. Uh, we only receive funding if we uh, uh, work uh, with some uh, reasonable level of scientific output. A few uh, statistics here. Uh, we have approximately one quarter of our users from within Germany, three quarters from Europe, and a small proportion from the rest of the world. Three quarters are already experienced electron microscopists, and one quarter have little or no experience. And about three quarters uh, come from universities, one quarter from research laboratories, and a small proportion from industry. We don't operate as a service facility. It's uh, more on the basis of high-end collaborations. If people come for service work, then uh, they, uh, that's normally done in Aachen University close by. And uh, in addition, because we work on hardware and software development, uh, we have some considerable activities in technology transfer, and that includes joint development projects with companies, patent families, licensing and know-how transfer agreements, and the royalties from uh, the development projects and the licensing agreements 
bring in somewhere around 10 or 20 percent of the operating costs of the facility each year. The Institute is now divided into three sections. My section is the one labeled at the bottom. It's called Physics of Nanoscale Systems. Uh, then on the left is a section which is headed by my colleague Joachim Meyer. This is focusing more on material science and engineering. And recently, we established a third section on structural biology led by Carsten Saxer. Uh, in the middle, we'll, I've also included uh, digitalization. Uh, we are thinking of establishing a fourth section on data science as well. All of these different aspects of electron microscopy operate together in the same building, and uh, we're working on establishing cooperations between them. So in my own section, which is physics of nanoscale systems, this is a section which focuses on pushing quantitative techniques in electron microscopy, especially studies of functional properties and dynamic processes through method and instrumentation development for tackling new materials problems. On the one hand, we push spatial resolution. The PICO electron microscope, which I mentioned before, has a spatial resolution of about 45 picometers uh, with combined chromatic and spherical aberration correction, but improved spatial resolution can also relate to measurements of functional properties. And on the lower part of this slide, this is an example showing electron magnetic circular chiral dichroism uh, of magnetic properties of materials measured atomic plane by atomic plane. Just running through a couple of other examples of our current focus, uh, the next slide here shows examples of the characterization of magnetic fields in very narrow uh, stripes of an alloy of iron germanium measured at low temperature. The different colors in the bottom frames show different magnetic states. The, the lower two frames, are, the magnetic states in these frames are referred to as magnetic skirmions which are of interest for future energy efficient magnetic recording and storage technologies. This is captured with a technique referred to as electron holography, and this allows us to map magnetic states with a spatial resolution of a few nanometers quantitatively. There is an activity related to applying biological low dose techniques to study beam sensitive materials uh, science problems in this case, this is an example showing uh, biological uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy techniques with, bio with uh, very dose efficient conditions uh, used to study a very beam sensitive mineral uh, with uh, a dose of only 10 to 40 electrons per square angstrom, but achieving about one angstrom in spatial resolution. And the last example I have is from our exam from our software group. This is on open source collaborative software development. One of the activities is labeled is referred to as Libertem for high throughput data management, real time data analysis and automation of workflows in electron microscopy. And that's being carried out together with a number of larger and smaller electron microscope companies. So this is an introduction to how we operate our, in our facility at the moment. I mentioned that we are now on the national roadmap for large infrastructure. So now we're going up to the level of uh, Germany as a country. And here, uh, after some years of lobbying the national ministry, we were invited to apply for the same funding stream, which operates synchrotrons, telescopes, uh, free electron lasers uh, and other large infrastructures. They allowed us to apply for uh, a much larger amount of funding than we would normally have access to, and we applied for five next generation electron microscopes with unique capabilities in uh, spatial, temporal, and spectroscopic characterization, correlative techniques, and automation. This application was successful. We applied 
in 2016 after three or four years of lobbying the ministry. Uh, the fact that we were successful didn't mean that we received the funding straight away. Uh, this just meant that we were on the national roadmap for large infrastructure. And then we had to still apply to different funding agencies uh, to uh, receive uh, the funding that the ministry had said uh, we were uh, now eligible for. And that funding came in two phases, phase one in 2019 and phase two uh, just uh, this year now. What that funding allows us to buy is five next generation electron microscopes, which are not on any manufacturer's roadmap. And in this way, we push the manufacturers to develop technologies that they uh, we're not intending to develop. And this spans from the physical sciences to biology. On the physical science side, uh, we have a transmission electron microscope and an atom probe in a single instrument, which is uh, an ultra high vacuum instrument. On the biological side, we have a spherical and chromatic aberration corrected biological transmission electron microscope with cooling between helium and room temperature uh, and other capabilities, including more advanced automation. And then in between, we have a number of other instruments which push spatial, spectroscopic, and temporal resolution, each of which has unique capabilities. Uh, we also, in the same pool of funding, obtain uh, funding for a, a building for these microscopes. And this picture shows uh, the building which should be finished in 2024. The microscope should arrive in 2024 and 2025. Uh, the picture shows offices on the left, and then there will be a long line of microscopes on the far side of the building, furthest as far as possible from any roads and disturbances. Uh, the idea is that we will now operate more as a distributed user facility across the country, and this hasn't been done before. This means that we will operate with three core partners, that is the Ulich Research Center, Aachen University and Dusseldorf University, four associated partners which each bring in expertise and provide links to their local communities. This is the Humboldt University in Berlin, the Max Planck Institute for Iron Research in Dusseldorf, University of Göttingen, and the University of Maastricht. And then together as a distributed user facility, we have to promise 75% access to external users on the future instruments, which is quite demanding, uh, but it depends on how you define who an external user is and how you define uh, uh, what, what 75, whether 75% 75 is 75% of 24 hours or to 75% of eight hours a day. Uh, we also have to promise to operate as a multi-method platform. And this means we have to link together electrons with X-rays, neutrons, supercomputing, instrumentation development, uh, nanofabrication and other characterization techniques. And that means perhaps eventually providing a single entry point not only within the Ulich Research Center, but also uh, across the country. This is currently under debate. And finally, uh, because of some of the funding came in the end from uh, a local uh, funding scheme to regenerate the local area from the phasing out of coal mines, we have to promise job creation in the local area. And this means we have to promise that bringing in electron microscopes will generate jobs for coal miners. Uh, or uh, in practice, we have to promise that it will create spin-off companies and it will attract uh, companies working on new materials and working on instrumentation development to the local area. So this is the current situation that we have on a national level within Germany. Uh, trying to bring in next generation electron microscopy technologies and setting up a distributed research infrastructure. And now I want to move to the European level. And here I mentioned there are four different areas I wanted to talk about. The first one is labeled esteem. 
and uh, within on a European level, we have the problem that we have uh, a very large number of university laboratories operating lower and higher end electron microscopes in different countries. Uh, we have funding on national levels and we have research laboratories as well, some of which uh, have funding to provide access to their facilities and some of which need funding to provide access to their facilities. And I'll begin by showing a table here and what the table shows in three columns is what is referred to as esteem, esteem two, and esteem three. These are three different projects which have been funded by the European Union. And these are integrated infrastructure projects. In each case, 15 to 20 electron microscopy laboratories, together with some small companies, applied for about 10 million euros of funding each time to provide access to their facilities to carry out joint research and to carry out networking activities and what the table shows here in different rows is the output that they either delivered or they promised during the lengths of the four or five year projects by establishing these networks of European laboratories so for S team three which is currently running this means uh, 5,000 access days in total between 15 or so uh, laboratories, 600 users, 16 workshops or schools, uh, serving 600 people who attended those workshops, about 600 joint publications between the laboratories and together with uh, external users who access those laboratories, uh, some 16 patents, uh, software development, software packages, which all have to be open, and then soft sample preparation protocols, which again have to be open. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next few slides, and then I'll describe why this particular scheme, esteem, is not sustainable and why we have to look for a different way of operating in the future in Europe. So what does ESTEAM stand for? It stands for Enabling Science Through European Electron Microscopy. This is all funding that comes directly from the uh, European Union in response to uh, a call. We have to lobby for the call, and then we have to respond to the call that we've lobbied for by writing a long proposal in the usual way. Uh, there are three aspects to the ESTEAM projects. The first is transnational access, and that means providing access to state-of-the-art instrumentation, which is hosted by the partners of the project. Uh, and this is access which is primarily uh, to electron microscopy for material science, a little bit for biology, uh, and primarily for university laboratories, but also for industry wherever possible. The map here shows the 15 uh, laboratories which are taking part in STEAM 3, which is currently running. Uh, they cover pretty much the length and breadth of Europe. Uh, as an example, within Germany, there are two laboratories. Uh, that is us in Jülich, and then there is Stuttgart, that is Peter van Aken, who is the coordinator of the whole project. In France, there are two laboratories. There is Toulouse in the south of France, and there is Orsay in Paris, uh, and uh, so on. In addition to these 15 laboratories around Europe, uh, there are about five industrial partners uh, who contribute to the project. And the idea of transnational access is you have to travel from one country to another one to access those facilities, and then, uh, provision is provided for free to the user. The user gets travel uh, expenses as well if they don't have them. And then the hosting laboratory receives funding uh, from the project for each day that a user is accessing those facilities. So transnational access is the first aspect. The second aspect is joint research activities. And here the partners work together to develop electron microscopy techniques to solve the materials problems that are brought to them. 
and they also focus on particular materials uh, challenges. In this particular funding period ST, for STEAM 3, they are the materials topics are related to ICT, energy, health, and transport, and then there is a separate activity related to automation and data management. The final activity is networking. And here, uh, these activities include organization of conferences, schools, workshops, webinars, uh, and uh, collaboration with other European projects, uh, other infrastructures, uh, promoting uh, the project communication and also uh, working on sustainability of the activity beyond the lifetime of the project. And that will be the next subject, which is eDream in a few slides time. Uh, just to give you uh, some a further idea about how STEAM works, uh, this is a list of the 13 work packages in the STEAM project. The top three which are highlighted are the networking activities. Work packages 4 to 11 are the different joint research activities. Work package 12 manages transnational access and work package 13 manages the project as a whole. And then just to give you a little bit of information about how an individual work package operates, I have a few slides which are taken from the, from the midterm review last year from uh, one of the work packages, work package 11, which is on data and automation. And here we had to report to the project officer what we did uh, in the first funding period. Uh, in this work package, the uh, objectives for data and automation are to develop capabilities related to data handling or open science and automation. Uh, and that uh, includes uh, um, developing standardized formats and interfaces related to uh, software, uh, automated and smart workflows, uh, and uh, new software for helping to interpret uh, experiments and uh, to develop new specialized imaging modes. So when we reported to the project officer, we, for example, really uh, reported in the first task in this work package uh, on dose and time optimized scanning transmission electron microscopy data acquisition. Uh, and in this case, the uh, figure on the right shows an activity related to live uh, processing of data for tychography in electron microscopy, which was developed during the project. In the second task, in this work package, uh, we reported on open source, source tools for quantitative spectroscopic data acquisition and processing. Uh, and that includes customized uh, uh, scanning uh, routines. And this is an activity which is mainly done in Antwerp and in Paris, but available for all of the partners. And then the third task was on automation of uh, operation of electron microscopes. This is mainly an activity carried out in Cambridge, Ulich, and Toulouse. And here, their example is on automated operation of electron microscopes for the acquisition and analysis of electron holograms, uh, but the automation can be used for any other electron microscopy techniques as well. So this is an example of how the current esteem project is working from the perspectives of transnational access, uh, joint research activities and networking activities. The problem is that it's not sustainable. And this is why I move on to the next topic, which is eDream. It's, esteem is not sustainable because these are projects which have a finite lifetime. Uh, and we need to set up a sustainable activity for electron microscopy in Europe, which goes beyond the lifetime of individual funded projects. In addition, the integrated infrastructure projects, uh, which uh, which funded esteem no longer exist. And what the European Union has decided to do is to separate 
uh, transnational access activities from joint research uh, and to focus on what they call grand challenges in Europe. Grand challenges relate to, for example, smart cities, tackling cancer, uh, and so on. And this means we cannot apply in the same way for networking activities uh, now. So what we've decided to do now is to set is to start to set up a European distributed research infrastructure for advanced electron microscopy with the uh, acronym E DREAM, where the E minus is uh, meant to represent an electron in the uh, in the logo. And the idea here is to set up uh, a non-profit initiative. And the idea is to set up uh, an activity which is sustainable, which uh, works to uh, promote cooperation between different European electron microscopy laboratories, not just the ones that took part in the esteem project, but other laboratories as well to foster collaborative research and to try to establish and fund transnational user access on a longer term scale than individual projects. Um, so the aims here are partly to work on strategic aspects related to electron microscopy, partly to try to uh, establish longer term funding uh, on a European level to create a single point of contact for policymakers and politicians so they know who to address if they want to address the electron microscopy community in Europe as a whole, to act as a single point of contact to electron microscopy organizations outside Europe, uh, to work on community driven activities on behalf of the community, uh, to try to bring together uh, complementary expertise, so it's not duplicated, and also uh, to link to other research infrastructures uh, and to work together, uh, not only as an electron microscopy uh, network, but also together uh, with other analytical infrastructures. We've set ourselves up initially as a set of eight partners, that's us in Ulich, then Toulouse, Trondheim in Norway, Antwerp in Belgium, Oxford in England, uh, then Trieste in Italy, Graz in Austria, and Barcelona in Spain. The reason for only focusing on eight partners to begin with is to be able to set up uh, this activity uh, quickly and effectively. Uh, if we decided that if we had more partners to begin with, uh, everyone would argue and nothing would happen. So uh, we, uh, we are currently one year into this initiative and we are about to open ourselves up to further members around uh, Europe. And so far we have started to establish four working groups. One working group is on European strategy for electron microscopy. And uh, here uh, we want to talk directly to the European Union to discuss how we can uh, make sure that we as a community are funded, especially for providing access to our facilities on a longer time scale than just individual short four or five year projects. So there are short term and long term aspects to these uh, strategic discussions. Then we have a working group on data policy with a focus on open science to develop approaches for best practice and to provide guidelines to the community as a whole. We have a software working group uh, which works on uh, activities uh, on data management, data reduction, simulation, automation, uh, and remote access for the benefit of the community. And we have a hardware working group, which fo focuses on standardization of hardware and interoperability uh, between uh, different instruments, not just between different electron microscopes provided by 
uh, different uh, commercial manufacturers, but also uh, extending to other correlative techniques. Uh, so each of these working groups has now uh, been set up and we are about to start uh, pilot projects in each of the working groups uh, to, uh, uh, so that we have some concrete activities uh, to get each of these working groups going. So uh, on a more administrative level, we are set up as an initiative, but we are now uh, changing uh, the structure from an initiative into a legal entity. And the reason for doing this is because uh, as a legal entity, we will be able to raise funding uh, directly as an entire electron microscopy community together and then to distribute that funding between partners. We cannot do that unless we are uh, set up as a legal entity. And what we have already done is as eDream, as a distributed research infrastructure, uh, we have applied for five uh, existing uh, calls on a European level. These are for activities related to materials for a circular economy, uh, to um, tackling cancer, developing remote access uh, to instrumentation, and developing digital twins uh, based on material characterization. So as eDream before trying to create uh, a longer term activity, which could be a European uh, strategic research infrastructure, uh, we are applying for existing calls uh, uh, um, as an interim measure between the current esteem projects and any future uh, uh, funding scheme, which will provide us with more sustainable funding to operate uh, across uh, countries in Europe. Um, the next uh, topic I wanted to mention briefly is the analytical research infrastructures in Europe. And this is, uh, this is also an initiative which was set up at about the same time as eDream. Uh, analytical research infrastructures in Europe uh, is a way to bring together uh, elect not, not only electron microscopy, but also other characterization techniques on a European level. And here we have, first of all, electron microscopy. We have the European Magnetic Field Laboratory. We have INSPIRE, which provides access to proton beams. We have Laser Lab, uh, which uh, works on uh, laser technologies. We have LEAPS, which is the League of European Acceler Accelerator-Based Photon Sources, that's synchrotrons. We have LENS, which is the League of Advanced European Neutron Sources. And we have RADIATE, which works on iron beam infrastructures. And so uh, within Europe, the idea here is to bring together about 120 research infrastructures across seven different characterization techniques again so we can talk at a higher level to policymakers uh, in brussels in the european union and on the map here we show all of the different facilities which are represented by these seven research infrastructures uh, and uh, on this page uh, we have the logo on the right uh, of the seven infrastructures and then on the left, we have a list of uh, the primary aims of uh, the analytical research infrastructures in Europe uh, to bring together the different characterization techniques uh, so they can speak with one voice. Uh, the idea is that uh, the spokesperson for the seven facilities rotates annually and this year it happens to be electron microscopy that is the spokesperson for all seven infrastructures in Europe. In addition to applying for existing European calls, uh, what we have done in the last year is to write two position papers which are both available for download from a resource called, called Zenodo. Uh, one is 
how, uh, the position paper on the left describes how the analytical research infrastructures in Europe will res are responding to the five key missions of the European Union. And I mentioned uh, cancer, there's, I mentioned smart cities, uh, there is healthy oceans, and there are two others. And the uh, position paper on the right focuses specifically on how the analytical research infrastructures uh, are responding to viral and microbial threats. And this was uh, written very rapidly uh, in response to the COVID pandemic last year. Uh, and most of the analytical infrastructures remained open and refocused themselves to work on COVID-related research. Uh, this position paper describes uh, some aspects of how they did this. So that is the analytical research infrastructures in Europe. And I briefly wanted to mention the European Microscopy Society uh, because uh, it's not so clear how the European Microscopy Society differs in its aims from ESTEAM and from eDream. Uh, in short, the European Microscopy Society uh, brings together national uh, electron microscopy societies across uh, Europe uh, with a focus on developments in instrumentation, methodology, and new applications of electron microscopy. Uh, and uh, it brings together 32 national societies, 6,000 individual members. Its aims include organizing European microscopy, the European Microscopy Congress, supporting uh, events in Europe, and then uh, publishing newsletters, publishing job announcements, uh, supporting smaller events, uh, publishing a yearbook, uh, and uh, promoting electron microscopy. In contrast to ESTEAM and eDream, it does not apply for projects to the European Union on behalf of the electron microscopy community. It does not act so much as uh, a lobbying organization, uh, and it does not act uh, uh, in uh, so much uh, in a strategic way in the sense of uh, establishing uh, working groups that try to raise uh, funding uh, to create sustainable initiatives for the electron microscopy community. So we have these complementary activities in Europe, European Microscopy Society, the current ESTEAM project, and then uh, the new eDream initiative. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to stick to 40 to 45 minutes, which was my instruction. And I think my time is almost up. So I will just uh, put back on this uh, slide the six different topics that I covered. And this is uh, our activities in the Ernst Ruska Center in Ulich, where we operate a national and international user facility. Then the national roadmap for large infrastructure in Germany, where we've been successful on uh, uh, attracting the same funding uh, as uh, uh, from, from the funding from the same uh, funding stream that normally operates uh, infrastructures that uh, electron microscopy does not have access to. Uh, we hope that this sets a precedent for other countries uh, gaining access to the same larger amounts of funding. And then on a European level, I went through the current project, the future initiative, uh, the links to other analytical research infrastructures, and then uh, the complementary activities of the European Microscopy Society. And I just have one final slide, which is a pretty picture, uh, because uh, one of our own activities relates to mapping magnetic microstructures in three dimensions. And this is an example which shows mapping magnetic skirmions in three dimensions, taking slices through the magnetic field uh, in a magnetic texture, and it, it's, a, it's an example of technique and instrumentation development, which realizes a capability that is not available with any other technique outside electron microscopy. 
So uh, maybe I hand back to Roger and uh, uh, hopefully I've stuck approximately to time and I've given you some idea of what's happening in Europe on a few different levels. Thank you very much, uh, Rafal. Time is perfect. Don't worry about that. <laughs> we would have another few minutes to listen to you. But you managed actually to come from the picometer scale to the large overview of Europe uh, within 45 minutes. That's a big achievement.